Matthew 8, 18 through 22. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to, le to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. This is God's word for God's people. Good morning, Providence. It's a wonderful day to be with you all. My name is Jake, and I get the joy of co-directing PC3, our college ministry. And I, if you guys haven't heard about fun stuff going on in the college ministry, there's some really cool stories that are going on right now. And so we were at Fall Retreat last weekend and had like five students give their lives to the Lord, which we're praising God for. It's been so cool. Uh, and so... Yeah, it's been a joy to be a part of that, and I have loved being a part of this church. I'm looking forward to what God might have for us today. Today we are continuing our walkthrough of Matthew 8 and examining the cost of following Jesus. And to start off, I want to share a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, but Captain James Cook, the great maritime explorer, charted large portions of the Pacific Ocean during the 17th century. He was a cartographer and made various maps that would be incredibly beneficial to future travel and commerce, and he also had the hearts of an anthropologist. So as Cook met Pacific peoples, he had sort of these philosophies and ideals about how his people um, from a totally different country, from different hemisphere, were going to interact with the people that they met. And his vision was he actually wanted to interact with them the least amount as, as possible in order to avoid unwanted um, negative impact on these people groups. However, on his second trip, one of the boats that they had was stolen when they visited Hawaii by a local people. And Cook, in response, took a local chief hostage to force the boat's return to his crew. A battle ensued, and Cook was slain on a Hawaiian beach. Cook had good ideas and ideals, but when push came to shove, he didn't follow through on what his values were, and this ultimately led to his death. Friends, Providence, we may be no different. When we talk about following Jesus and being disciples of him, we may very often believe that we have it all together. We talk about what it means to follow and abide with him. We read books about how to reach our neighbors and how to share the gospel. But some of us cannot even remember the last time that we've invited a non-Christian to church or city group or shared the gospel with them. We may call Jesus our Lord, but if, we were to call, but if he were to call us to move to the Middle East and to go to a place where our lives would probably be in danger for being Christians, how many of us would say, how many of us would say, hey, I'm going to follow what Jesus has called me into? We can intellectually have a belief about who God is and what we're supposed to do, and we can sound very wise when we talk in other, to other Christians in our city groups and our Bible studies. But we may lack the passion or trust in Jesus to follow through with our lip service. But province, this is a danger because when we are not willing to give Jesus our full devotion and our full trust, it sets a terrible example for the world. It sets a terrible example for our kids on how to follow Christ. It sets a terrible example to non-Christians as we live as hypocrites, where we claim to be changed by the God of the universe, claiming that a holy living God now lives inside of us through his spirit, but then our lives somehow remain exactly the same as what they were before. In not understanding the cost of following Jesus and being faithful to it, when we don't understand what it's going to cost us, one of two things is going to happen. We may see people who would place their faith in Jesus, but then would fall away later because they didn't actually count the cost. Or they will live a lukewarm lifestyle where they don't actually recognize Jesus as Lord over their lives. And through this, we will also miss out on a joy-filled life that has nothing in comparison to anything that this world has to offer. To not know what it takes to be a disciple of Jesus, it's dangerous, it's painful, and we will miss out on a greater joy that Jesus has to offer to us. Promise the prayer for this morning is that we would not be a people who are faithful to lip service, but we would be a people who are fully devoted and fully trusting in our God. Providence, this is what we need to walk away knowing today as a family. 
The cost of following Jesus is immense, but it is absolutely worth it. As we dive into our text this morning, in Matthew 8, there's going to be two separate thoughts that we are going to see through these few verses. The first one being, following Jesus requires our undivided trust, and two, following Jesus requires our undivided affection. Province, would you pray with me? Abba, you are kind and generous to your people. God, you have saved us, that the story of Christians is that we have done nothing to be faithful to you, that we have been runaways and rebels, but God, through your grace and mercy that we did not deserve, God, you have saved us, and Father, we get to look forward to an eternity with you, not because of what we've done, but God, because of what you have done for us on the cross. And Father, we get to have joy and peace knowing the great work that you have accomplished for your people that they could not accomplish for themselves. And Father, even after we've been saved, you are still slow to anger and gracious with us that, God, as we live in sin and we reject the callings that you have for us over our lives, when we choose apathy or choose outright rebellion, Father, you still show us grace and mercy. Father, we remember this morning how good you are and how kind you are as we wrestle through our sin. And Father, we remember what you've done for us, God, that it would show, that would remind us that you are truly worthy of following. Father, would three things be true of today? God, would you be exalted, that we as a church would leave with an elevated view of who you are and how kind and good you are. God, that we would leave with, with a humble hearts. Father, that you would show us our sins, show us the ways that we do run away from you. And Father, would providence leave changed, not because the sermon was great, but God, because you are working through your Holy Spirit to change us as a people. Jesus, these are our prayers. We need you. We're desperate for you. Would you be with us this morning? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Province, read with me verses in Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 20. It says this. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Okay, what's happening here? So Run last week walked us through the earlier verses in Matthew 8, and what we see is that Jesus shows his authority over by performing various miracles. We see him healing the sick. We see him healing people who are unclean, making them clean once again. And we see that he is authority, and he performs these incredible miracles that absolutely change people's lives for the better forever. Many people, as they witness these miracles going on, they see all this incredible stuff that's happening. They see the hype that surrounds Jesus, and they're going, I want to be a part of what's going on here. The scribe, this person who would know the scriptures, is walking up to Jesus and is saying, hey, I've seen the incredible things you've done. I want to be with you. I want you to teach me. I want you to use me up. I want to follow you because I want to be a part of this incredible stuff going on. The scribe is seeing the wonderful works of Jesus and saying, I don't want to miss out on these things. Now, when I'm doing ministry and I'm hanging out with college students, the the first men, the first dudes that I am ready to disciple, they're hungry. They probably look a lot like the scribe who's walking up to Jesus and saying, I'm going to do anything. I want to be thrown into the fire. I've got zeal. I've got passion. Use me up. Disciple me. I want to become, I want to learn what it looks like to follow Jesus well. The people who are wide-eyed and ready to go are the easiest people to disciple. And so to think about this from a ministry standpoint, from a strategic standpoint, to have someone walking up to Jesus, instead of Jesus saying, walking up to them and saying, hey, come follow me, this person walks up to him and is like, hey, you don't even have to ask me. I want to be a part of what's going on here. Teach me. Make me a fisher of men. I want to be like you. Help me grow. Let me be of use. I'll follow you anywhere. And looking at Jesus' response, through the last four years that I've had a chance to be in full-time ministry, I have never given any sort of response similar to this to someone who would say that they want to be discipled by me. Jesus' response right here, he says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. One, Jesus' response sounds almost like a riddle that this person's going to have to figure out and decipher. And two, Jesus seems to be killing this man's excitement. This guy's excited and ready to follow Jesus, and Jesus is sort of like, hey, calm down. You need to think about this and think about what you're saying right now. What Jesus says here is that even the birds have better housing than what he and his disciples do. 
Jesus was essentially homeless during his ministry, and he depended on the mercy of others, and he owned very little himself. That the God of the universe humbled himself, came down to earth, and although he had authority over all things, he had very little to call his own during his years of ministry. He's saying, this is going to be hard. This isn't going to be luxurious. We're not going to be having the fancy Airbnbs that you see on Facebook and Instagram to stay at when we travel. We're not going to be having millionaire friends who are going to let us stay in their guest bedrooms. And further, Jesus doesn't, doesn't, just, doesn't just have a nice place to stay. Jesus says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He doesn't even have a friend with a pull-out futon that may or may not be less comfortable than going straight on the floor. He's saying the Son of Man is homeless. From a strategic ministry standpoint, this shouldn't make sense at all. Jesus, why are you not buying into this man's excitement? Tell him to hop in a boat and use him up. Teach this man how to say a prayer so that he's saved, and then have this man follow you and start doing ministry with you so you can reach more people. When someone's goal is to sell a product rather than focusing on giving a product to the people who actually need it, they don't start with the negatives. You start with the positives, and you let the purchaser figure out the negatives, hopefully after the warranty has expired. Jesus is not doing that here. Let me spoil Jesus' motivation, Providence. He is not interested in wishy-washy disciples. Too often in our picture of American Christianity, we highlight all the best parts of following Jesus. We are not truthful about what it costs us and how hard it truly is. And this does two things. People who profess faith in Jesus turn away when they realize that following Jesus is incredibly difficult, or they dismiss the callings and hardships that come with Christianity. They still claim to be Christians, but they live a lukewarm lifestyle where it's not hard at all for them. Jesus isn't here to hire as many workers as possible. He isn't here to hire seasonal workers who are going to work through the holiday season and then hope to never see them again. He's looking for people who will be with him for the long haul through thick and thin. And ultimately, what he's saying to this expression is, at the end of the day, all you have is me. Is that enough for you? Are you sure you want to be my disciple? Jesus is declaring here that if you want to be my disciple, what you find your hope and security in must be me first, or you will not follow me. Jesus looks at our hopeful hearts and how we say, Jesus, I want to follow you, and then he asks, but do you have the resolve to follow through with what you say? It reminds me of Matthew 15 where Jesus says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Friends, here's what is incredibly scary about this first person walking up to Jesus. He's a scribe. He knows all the right answers. He knows theology. He has books of the Bible memorized from a young age. He knows all the right answers, and he has the theology to back up the reasons for what he says. But Jesus here knows that this man's heart is not in the right place as he comes to him. This scribe has seen Jesus doing all these incredible works, but Jesus' question pierces his heart. Because if this man truly wants to follow him, he's going to have to give up much in order to do so. Friends, so... The question here is a really hard question that takes a lot of humility. Do you know all the right answers, but is your heart actually far from Jesus? Have you grown up in the church? Have you been a part of a a Christian family in your upbringing, but then when it's actually talking about you spending time with the Lord and pursuing him and having your own relationship with him, do you offer lip service and say how good God is, but then do not actually have a heart that's close to your Lord and Savior? That's a difficult question to ask. If this man truly wants to follow Jesus, he's going to have to give up much to do so, and he's going to have to count the cost before he does. Friends, we know that our faith is genuine if we persevere in following Jesus. We know that our faith is genuine if we trust him. If we trust him, we follow him. What does that look like? If we have a head knowledge of what Jesus desires of us, we are only going to follow through his teachings if we trust him more than the alternative. You will be called to preach the gospel if you are a Christian, which in itself is an offensive message because we say, hey, the gospel is good news because you need to be saved, but to tell people that they need to be saved, they need to know what they're being saved from, otherwise it doesn't make sense that Jesus died on the cross. 
So you have to tell people you're sinful, you're rebellious, and you actually don't deserve eternity with God, but you actually deserve eternal separation from him. You have to share the bad news. That's an offensive message to people, and people more often than not will not like it. When I became a Christian, I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of my relational security. Province, do you trust Jesus more than you trust relational security? You'll be called to take your hard-earned money and not just give portions of it to the government, but to also tie that to the local church. And further, you are called to be radically generous, even when it hurts. Friends, do you trust Jesus more than financial security? You'll be called not just to love the people who love you the most, but you'll be called to love those who you would find the hardest time calling friend. People in your state group that you may not like, people that you may not enjoy being around. But do you trust Jesus that it's worth your time, that Jesus can use people that you don't like to sanctify you? And would you be calling Jesus to actually make your heart, to create in you a new heart, to love the people that you are surrounded by? You'll be called to be committed to a local church, even when the preaching isn't fantastic every week, or even when the worship isn't everything that, isn't even the way that you would worship or have a worship set. You and the sermons are not entertaining Do you trust Jesus that he will still use his Holy Spirit to change you even when things are not to your preferences? You'll be called to sacrifice for your children every hour that they are awake, even when it's hard. That you'll work a full-time job and give your life to that and then go home and before getting a chance to rest, you have another person, another human being that you have to take care of physically, emotionally, and you're called to take care of spiritually. Do you trust Jesus that that matters and that it's worth it to persevere through? Friends, there are hundreds of challenges for what we could have or what we could call us into. For what does it look like to trust Jesus? If nothing on that list resonates with you, maybe there's something else that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you in these moments, and I pray that he does. But if you're sitting here and thinking that you have a perfect trust in Jesus and that following Jesus is not hard at all, Perhaps you're not following a man who was crucified on a cross. Providence, if you don't find it hard to follow Jesus, if you don't find yourself being challenged, it is likely because you are not actually following him. When we place our faith in Jesus, it's not because of our own effort. It's not because we have earned anything to make us worthy of being saved. That would be a heresy. But living out what we claim to believe is going to be costly and it is going to call for us to be faithful and determined. Becoming more like Jesus and living for Jesus is not what's going to save you because we are justified by our faith, but faith will change our perspective that we have on the world. That even when things get hard, when we look at Jesus and we know what he's done for us, we can still have joy and peace, not because of our worldly circumstances, but because Jesus is worthy of our praise and he's worthy of following. So therefore, we are motivated to do hard things because we don't find our security in having an easy life, but we find our security and hope in a good king who died for us and showed his unconditional love for us when we did not deserve it and gives us eternal security for the rest of eternity. If we have the belief and trust that someday we are going to die, and if we have a good theology and understand that that we, in our sin, are not worthy of going to heaven someday, if we know that in our sin we are actually rebelling and pushing ourselves away from God, that we are not to live an eternal relationship with him, if we have that knowledge that the, the wages of our sin is death, But yet we have a faith and a comfort knowing the fact that someday we're going to get to heaven and Jesus is going to look at us and go, no, 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 I paid for them. My blood covers their sin, that they are free to go. They can spend eternity with me forever. I am their prize. Friends, how much faith does that actually take to believe? If you have a knowledge of your sin and you have a knowledge of how good and glorious our God is, how much faith does it actually take to believe, wow, God is going to save me someday and I do not deserve it? We trust Jesus with our eternal life. Why would we not trust him through his commands on a daily basis? Friends, to follow Jesus, you may lose everything in this world, everything that the the false teaching of the prosperity gospel would teach us, health, wealth, a happier you, a easy, peaceful life. Such a heresy will make Jesus a means to an end where Jesus is supposed to be the end prize and the end goal. 
Jesus is what we get. We don't come to Jesus to get this, this, or this. We don't come to Jesus to become happier. We don't come to Jesus and get health or wealth or anything else. We come to Jesus because Jesus is worthy of our trust and our faithfulness. As I walk with the Lord, I know that there are daily, on a daily basis that I choose actions and I do things that would not prove that I actually have a, a true trust in the Lord. I know that there are times when I give into sin and there are ways that I live in rebellion where I'm not spending all the time in the word that a lot of times I find myself doing ministry for God, but I'm not actually doing ministry with him. And there's things that are hard that I know I'm supposed to do, but I don't do them. I know that Jesus is better and worthy in my head, but I need something to happen in my heart to actually believe that and know that that's true. Providence, to follow Jesus means that you are trusting in him. You're not placing your trust in a place to rest your head like what foxes and birds have. You're not placing your hope in health or wealth or the American dream. You're placing your faith in Jesus as your savior, provider, healer, shepherd, and God king, and he is better. This man comes to Jesus and says that he will follow him wherever he goes, and Jesus stifles his enthusiasm back by saying, if you follow me, I'm all you've got. Providence, to be a follower of Jesus is to acknowledge this reality and then to say to Jesus, I will follow you through the highs and lows of this journey. I will not turn back. You're all that I've got, and you're better than anything that this world could offer me. Providence, when you think about your life, when you think about Jesus, do you view him as all that you've got? Some of us, like how I think through sometimes, might be thinking through that question. Something else might pop into our head is more worthy of my trust. Or something else might deceitfully make me believe that something else is better for in a season. As some of us count the cost, we might be asking the question, okay, is Jesus actually worthy though? I think it's the Lord's providence that another man would walk up to Jesus after he responds to the scribe. Providence, read with me verses 21 through 22 says this. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. So this disciple doesn't come with the abundant enthusiasm that we saw in the scribe, but rather comes with a request before he will follow the son of man wherever he goes. So different from the first disciple, this man has thought about what it would mean to follow Jesus, and he's thought about his father. Now, there are different interpretations about what might be going on here, and there's two big ones. There's the, the first, which would be the layman's reading, which would be to say, okay, this man has his father to bury, that either his father is on his deathbed, um, that he's going to die soon, and there's going to be a burial that's going to come, or what this might also be saying is that this man is saying, hey, uh, I know that there's an inheritance waiting for me, and I'm waiting, I need to wait for my dad to die so I can actually receive the inheritance that I'm supposed to receive as the firstborn son. In both of these cases, this man is counting the costs and saying, I'm not sure if following Jesus is worth it in these moments. If the man follows Jesus, he's either going to be dishonoring to his family, and they are going to, he's going to abandon them and lose his family connections, or two, he's going to miss out on a fortune that was supposed to be given to him. Either way, he's counting the cost and is not sure if it's worth it. He says, let me go and be honorable towards my father, or let me go get my inheritance first, and then I'll be good to go. Jesus, I've counted the cost. Let me go get this, and then I'm all yours. And Jesus responds, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Oof. In one scene, we have Jesus stunting the passion of a potential disciple to say, are you sure you know what you're getting into? And then for the next who has reservations, he says, follow me, and the spiritually dead can take care of their dead. This creates a wrestle in my heart as I read those words. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. Jesus, 
saying that we shouldn't go to funerals, or is he saying that we shouldn't go to funerals, or I shouldn't be wise with my finances, or whatever this might be? No, it's not what Jesus is saying right now. What Jesus is saying is that if honoring your father is going to come before you come and follow me, you're not putting me first and following me. Providence, there's always going to be something else that will give you an excuse not to pursue Jesus. Your health your commitments, having a lot going on during the week, your passions. There are a thousand things that you can make excuses for, for not coming to church, for not being gathered through city group, for not being in the word, whatever those things might be. There are a thousand excuses that we could give. This man's excuse is to say, I want to go to my father's funeral. What's a better excuse than that? There is always going to be someone or something else to bury. What Jesus demands of us is to call him Lord over our lives. What Jesus demands of us in his authority as the God of the universe is for his followers not to be lukewarm and make excuses, but to give him our full devotion to him first. It means that if Jesus calls for us to give up anything in our lives, we will know and commit ourselves to those those things because we love him first. Instead of saying, Jesus, I'm going to follow you after I get past this life stage, or Jesus, I'm going to follow you after I get to this place in my family first, or after I've gone through college and I've enjoyed the party phase and gotten my sins out of the way and enjoyed what this world has to offer, Jesus, then I'm going to follow you, or Jesus, then I'm going to start being faithful with this command that you have given me. All the things that we could put first, I don't think anything would match up with, hey, can I go to my dad's funeral? Jesus is saying, if you follow me, if you want to be spiritually alive, leave behind the things of this world that are not going to give you life. Leave those things to be worshipped and treasured by those who are going to die with those things as they waste away and have no hope. Leave behind your excuses and recognize me as worthy of your trust and devotion and your time. Christ is proclaiming that he deserves your supreme loyalty and attention before anything else, and he is worthy of your undivided trust. This is the cost of being a disciple. But then what does that mean about funerals and other important things that are not explicitly Jesus? I wonder that if this man had taken that moment to process what Jesus had said to him, if he counted the cost and he, he thought through who Jesus was, and he had a real moment where he looked at Jesus and said, I know that you are worthy of my devotion, worthy of my trust, and I will follow you wherever you go, even though it's going to be hard. I wonder if Jesus would look at this man and say, okay, let's go bury your father now. The calling is not to forsake everything in this world. It's not to stop attending funerals or to quit your job to evangelize full time. Those things are still good, and there's lots of commands in Scripture for why those things are valuable. But there is going to be a change in our priorities through our lives. There is going to be a change in the perspective we walk through life and the motivations by which we live. You cannot please God without being a Christian, without being saved, because your affections are not for him. But if God saves you, he will create in you a new heart that will desire him and will change everything about your life. Instead of going to work with the main motivation being to make money and provide for your family and retire someday, which are not terrible things, your first priority will be to view your workplace as a place to disciple, to do your work to the best of your ability, to glorify God in everything you do, and to make relationships so that you can disciple others. A student going to class will continue doing so. Their calling is not to drop out of school and become a full-time missionary, but rather thinking and But rather than thinking, okay, how can I be successful or how can I just enjoy my college years, they're going to look at themselves and say, Jesus, I want to serve you. I want to give my life to you because you are worthy. How would you use me during my college years to make an impact? Jesus is not saying that common graces are bad, but they have to be placed in order. So here's the question, Providence. What comes in between you and your walk with Jesus? Where do you not have a right perspective of being a part of his kingdom first and viewing him as Lord and Savior over your life? Where do you not believe that he's worthy of your trust and worthy of your affection? Do you feel distracted at church by scores of a football game or wish you could be somewhere else rather than listening to some 26-year-old preach? 
Do you not feel like sinning because that's not your vibe when there are over 50 commands in Scripture to sing to the Lord? Is your devotion, is your walk with Jesus on your terms, or is it on the terms of the authority of Jesus and how the kingdom of God is going to be in heaven someday? Do you neglect to spend time in the Word? What's the first thing that motivates you to get out of bed in the morning? Is it, Jesus, what do you have for me? I want to go on this journey with you. Or is it to be entertained and comfortable or to meet the requirements of the phase of life that you are in? What motivates you? What drives your everyday lifestyle? Are there things in this world that you talk about much more than how great your Jesus is? What is found in your heart will outflow out of your mouth. So what comes out of your mouth? Do you talk about how good Jesus is with others? Do, do, you know, do people know you as the weird question in your workplace? Or do they know you by something else that you care about? Friends, when people talk about you, when people remember you, will they remember you as someone who placed their total trust and total devotion in their relationship with Christ? Friends, we're coming to a year of focusing on the mission aspect of our core values here at Providence And I know that even in my own heart, there have been times where I have not trusted Jesus with the the callings that our churches felt that we should be focusing on and giving our time to. I lived in a house last year that I didn't really enjoy being in. I didn't really enjoy my roommates all the time. And so I found a lot of my time was like doing ministry or hanging out with other people. So I wasn't at home. And so when we were in city groups and we were talking about, hey, map out your neighborhood so you can start building relationships with people and maybe get a chance to share the gospel with them someday, I showed up to city group that week as a city group leader, and I had two names which I had previously known beforehand. One person who lived in a guest house that was rented out um, in my backyard, and then two, someone who came to my front door one day because we actually stole one of their packages that was delivered to our house. I, was, I went through a whole entire month of this being a specific challenge in our city group, and I had been done nothing to be faithful to it. And I have to ask myself, as I've been disobedient, as I have not had a passion and a love all the time to evangelize to my neighbors, I have to ask myself, am I loving something more than I love Jesus? Am I loving the comfort of not having to go out of my way to do these things? Am I loving the ability to avoid awkward conversations? Does Jesus actually have my full devotion? Friends, what we see in Scripture is that when we become Christians, just as there is a death, burial, and resurrection for Jesus himself, there is also a death, burial, and resurrection of our old hearts. The things we care about, the things we give our passions to, the things that do not glorify Jesus will die. They are going to be buried in that Jesus is resurrecting us and making us new and giving us new passions for him in this life. That we will be made new and by the power of the Holy Spirit we will be infatuated with Christ. In the book, Let the Nations Be Glad by John Piper, John tells a story of a missionary who goes to Africa and meets a man from an African village. And this man's name is also John. And this missionary goes to, finds this man named John as John is completing different tasks throughout the day um, out on the road. And he builds a conversation, builds a relationship with him. And at the end of it, he shares the gospel with him. And John, hearing this for the first time, never hearing the name of Jesus before, bows his name to Jesus as his Lord and Savior for the first time. That John preaches, that uh, John pre- or this missionary preaches to John saying uh, that you are dead in your sins, that you are unworthy of a relationship with Christ, that there is sin in you that makes you not want to follow Jesus, but God died for you 2,000 years ago on a cross and took your place that you've been atoned for, and if you place your faith in him, you will experience eternal life. John received that. And the first thing that he wanted to do was to go share it with his tribe, to go share it with his people from his village. So John's walking back and thinking about he just received Jesus as Lord and Savior and just heard the best news that he could ever hear before. He's probably full of enthusiasm and ready for what's about to come. John enters into the village and he, he begins knocking on the doors of the various huts, talking to them and preaching the gospel door to door. And the people in his village thought that he was crazy. They had no idea who this Jesus guy was. They didn't want to take the time to understand him. They wanted to keep going about their days. And John, eventually the chieftain, heard about what he was doing and commanded for all the people to come out. And maybe John in these moments was thinking, here's my opportunity to share the gospel with everyone. They're all going to give their lives to him. 
But instead what happens is the chieftain calls for the man to grab John by the shoulders and pin him to the ground. And he calls for the women to make whips made of shards of glass. And they begin whipping him. And they continue whipping him over and over and over until he passes out from the torture and the pain. They take John's body and they drag him out to a well outside the village and they leave him there to die. A few hours go by and John recovers and wakes up confused and not sure what just happened. A missionary comes to him and he receives the best news that he could ever hear and gives his life to the Lord and he's a new creation already. But when he preached the gospel to his village, they didn't respond and in fact they actually started attacking him. What's going on? What did I say wrong? Uh, maybe I just didn't say the right things. Maybe I, didn't, maybe I need to uh, do this different or have a different strategy with it. I wonder how many of us would do what John does next, but John actually walks back into the village again. And he goes door to door, knocking on the huts, trying to preach the gospel to his people that he loves. And sooner than the time before, the men come out, they grab him by the shoulders, and they pin him to the ground, and the women take whips made out of glass, and they begin whipping him again. And twice in the same day, John is tortured and whipped until he goes unconscious. To go under this excruciating pain, we would imagine that John would probably die at this moment, but through a miracle, after a few hours of laying by that well, he recovers again. He eventually gets the strength to draw up water and try to clean up his wounds a little bit and refresh himself. And what does John do in those moments as he's questioning, what's going on? What am I doing wrong? He asks Jesus for strength, and supernaturally, he gets up and he walks into the village a third time. Third time, before he's able to speak a word, before he's even allowed uh, any word of the gospel, before he's able to say hi to anyone, the people, the men grab him, they pin him to the ground, and the women begin to hit him with whips. And as John is pinned to the ground, he looks up, he doesn't know what to do. He's changed his gospel presentation twice. He's been faithful to what he's called to do. He's supposed to go share this good news that he just received that day with everyone in his village. And now these people are whipping him, the people that he loves. He's trying to share this good news with them. Why are they not understanding? And John, in these moments, has only one thing to cling to. He clings to his security in Christ and trusting Jesus. And he clings to his devotion to his king. John, not having anything else to rely upon, not having anything else to put his hope in, begins screaming out the name of Jesus over and over and over. He looks up and he sees the women who are whipping him and they are confused and there's weird looks on their faces as they don't know what's going on right now. And eventually John would close his eyes as he falls unconscious for the last time. Two days later... John would wake up again in the middle of a hut bed. He would find his wounds are being patched up. He would see herbs and medicines that have been provided for him, and he would see food and drink that is at the ready for him at the moment that he would wake up. One of the women from the village comes rushing in, and as she hears John moving, and she's exclaimed and excited, and she goes and tells the chieftain. The chieftain comes in and says, we were ready to kill you, and we really wanted to kill you. But as we heard you crying out, we saw your desperation of how faithful you were to this message that you had to share to us. We realized that we, before we kill you, we should at least hear out what the message is that you have for us. So they give John a few days to recover, and John comes out, and they get the other, the entire village around, and John gets an opportunity to preach the gospel faithfully and all the way through. And the entire village gives their lives to Jesus. John's hope after being tortured for the third time was to cling to Jesus for his hope and security, to know that his king was the only thing worthy of his affection through the highs and lows of life. He knew that following Jesus was worth it, even though it was hard, even though it brought suffering to his life. Providence, where is your hope? What do you trust in on a daily basis? Who has primary affections of your heart? If it's not Jesus, you're not accepting the requirements that Jesus has in his authority of what he calls for his followers to be like. 
Jesus is looking to gather true disciples? Do you trust Jesus with your security, your life, and your hope? Is your affection for him more than any good gift that he could give you, any common grace, or anything that you find joy in in this life? Friends, I beg of you that Jesus would be first, that you would give up everything that is not him, that he would capture your eyes before anything else, that we as a church would live differently than what American Christianity would call us into. That province would be a church that has counted the cost of following Jesus and would still say he is worthy and we will follow him wherever he goes. That we would be a church who has given their undivided trust and their undivided affection towards our king because he is worthy. So the non-Christians in the room, if you haven't submitted your life to Jesus or even if you're wrestling these moments, have I actually placed my faith in Jesus? As I have found throughout my life, even as I have suffered in various ways, and many Christians have suffered, as John would suffer in those ways, would still say that Jesus is the best thing that you can give your life to. Non-Christians know that he is worthy and place your faith in him, that there would be no turning back because he is better. In Providence Church, the calling of the Christian is the same. The call of Jesus is is to those who want to be a part of his kingdom. It is going to cost them everything in this world. It is a fight. It is a battle that many of you have been fighting for decades or have been fighting for even a few days. Whether you've known him for a little while or many years, I want to encourage us by looking at 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 10. So I would encourage you, to close your eyes and just receive these words this morning into your heart. It says this. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. We have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in the heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy, the reward for trusting him with the salvation of your souls. Providence, whether you're 20 years old in the room or 80 years old in the room, whether you have 80 years left to live or 20 years left to live, even if that season of your life was full of dread and trials and suffering because you were following Jesus, someday you'll be with him for the rest of eternity forever because of what he did for you on the cross. That is where we place our hope and our trust, not in the things of this life, but we place our trust in the finished work of Jesus because there is an eternal glory that is to come. Because of that eternal glory, because Jesus is who he is, because he is God, because he is good, he is worth giving our lives to. Being a disciple of Jesus will cost you everything, but you will gain far more than you could give up. You will trade dirt for diamonds. Providence, will you pray with me? Abba, this is a heavy message, God. Father, that you want us to count the cost of what it means to follow you so that we can be faithful to what it actually means to be a disciple of you. Father, when the world sees hypocritical Christians, where it sees people who give lip service and are not faithful to you, God, There is no, it's not attractive to non-Christians. It's not attractive to the rest of the world. But Father, when your people are sold out for you, when they are true disciples, when they fight to be faithful for what you have called us to be, and when they fight to be radically different from what our culture or the rest of the world would say, God, you get so much glory out of that. 
Father, as our church goes through trials and hardships, and God, we are tested to see whether or not we actually have our trust in you, and we are tested to see if we actually have our affections for you first. Father, just as you would give John, a one-day Christian, a supernatural strength and confidence in you, Father, would you give us supernatural confidence as well. Father, that we would know that you are worthy of our affection, worthy of our trust, and God, that we would leave all things behind trusting you. God, that there would be no turning back in our lives because you are better. Father, would you sanctify us as a church where we know that you are worthy, and God, would you change us from the inside out and give us new hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Ah.